you, Ming, for the opportunity to talk to your your group um, around uh, what we've been doing with um, some of our um, understanding of our data quality and particularly um, applying fair pr principles to some of our data. Um, you, you've mentioned that GNS is a little bit like CSIRO um, in that we are a, a government-owned research organisation and we specialise in the, in the geosciences sector of the New Zealand science landscape. So yeah, we, we have a, a mandate in, to work in things like geological resources, geological hazards, environment and climate related themes. And underpinning that is a, a whole group of work which goes under this land and marine geoscience in the bottom left of the slide, which is essentially underpinning geoscience for some of these more applied ends of our research. Anyway, so that's um, kind of a, a very quick pre of uh, what we do at GNS. Um, I'm, a, I'm a geologist. Um, I've worked in the geological mapping space uh, for a long time, and it included a, a tour in Australia from the late 80s until the mid-90s. Um, and I worked in one of Geoscience Australia's former geysers uh, for a number of years. So, um, and a lot of what I brought back to New Zealand was had its origins and in, in what I learned in Australia. So the work that we're doing here is, uh, is largely the work of uh, myself and uh, my close ex-colleague now, Maria Mavroidi, who was hoping to join this meeting, but can't, um, unfortunately. So um, just in mind, I'm going to be presenting this, but um, please, this is also very heavily Maria's work and, and that I'm presenting here. So I'm sure you all know what fair principles are, and, and I don't really need to do sort of explain those to this audience here, but I guess the key things to get out of it are that it, it's actually about machine-to-machine um, -machine understanding of these principles. It's not just about a, a human a relationship, but it's also about machines being able to find things, access, etc., etc. So I won't dwell on this slide too long. And I guess um, in the wider context of, you know, why we undertook a, a, a particular analysis here, well, in New Zealand, we've got some rather old principles relating to data and information management. And these essentially are predating the fair principles, but they, they, they're talking about things that need to be open and readily available and reusable, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of these concepts existed well before fair principles and are expressed in, in government uh, requirements. In the, around 2020, we were designing a, a new set of business plan measures. We do this every year and, and, and we often want to try and find ones in the data space. And so what we're trying to do with this particular one was we will say, well, fair principles exist. How can we actually use them to get an understanding of our current state of fair compliance and our potential to improve that over the years? So that's essentially the driver. So we've just got embedded in our business plan. And once you do that, of course, you have to have to comply and go for it. So, but it did raise a few questions. So what is fair principles compliance? How do you know when you are compliant? And can you actually quantify that in a way that you can then say, well, um, in a few years time, I want to be even more compliant or have a greater degree of compliance. So this is kind of the drivers behind why we went through this process. So we were looking for a, a practical solution to try and give us a measure of, of how good our fair compliance was. So as a research organization, we, we invest heavily in our geoscience data sets and um, We've, we've got this um, sense of what are high value data sets versus ones which are maybe not so high value. And you can see all the criteria on the left hand side there in terms of what constitutes a high value geoscience data set. And when I say data set, you know, um, it's, a, it's a pretty elastic term. Um, a data set is just a collection of related information, 
but that in itself could contain many other data sets. So this 120 number that we're pulling out is actually probably just the tip of the iceberg when it comes down to um, really breaking down to the to the um, to the to the finest level. And the example there is a, a geological map collection, the geological map of New Zealand. And you can have a, basically a product line underneath it, map seven, and then you can have a, a one of the parts of the product is a geological map and or the GIS version of it. And then you can also have that GIS broken up into a whole bunch of layers. So each one of those technically could be regarded as a data set. Uh, but in this exercise, we're treating the whole lot as just a single data set. So the reality is we've probably got in, in many, many thousands, if not into the tens of thousands of, of, of data sets to work with at GNS. <clears throat> so for this exercise of those 120, we've, we've taken, uh, I think it's, I can't quite read my own slide here, but I think it's in the order of, um, did I say 50 at the top? Um, anyway, it's, um, and we've got two different classes that we, or groups that we're dealing with, what we call the nationally significant collections and databases. So these are, these are data sets which uh, have got a, an official government recognition status, and they are actually well funded and, and reasonably continuously funded. And they haven't had much um, or no um, reassessment over the last 20, no, it's getting to yeah, 20, 23 years or so. So the, the data sets have basically, no, 33, I should say. So the, these data sets have been locked in stone for a long time. They have grown internally and, and their scope may have changed. But each one of the, the um, on the left-hand column, what is what we call a, a data resource. Let's say, and then within that, a bunch of data sets. So the geological map I was referring to here is, is just one of those at the top. Can you see my cursor when I'm moving it? Me, my mouse. Yes, yes, okay. I can. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so I can use my mouse for pointing if I need to, and and so we've got things like a rock collection and database. We've got the uh, national seismic um, or earthquake database, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so these are all of the geoscience um, data sets that we're going to apply this fair analysis to. The other data sets or the group here is our natural hazards one. So these represent, represent the data sets which are not in part of the nationally significant ones, but they're more, but they are still incredibly significant, important. And, and these are generally not as well funded and may contain these data sets here. So this is the, the basically what we're running the assessment over, these ones. We do have a whole bunch of other ones in the natural resources space, the environment and climate space and so on. But these are the ones we concentrated on for this exercise. And again, when you break down those FAIR principles, and this is coming out of the, the Go FAIR initiative, you, you, each one of the, the principles um, can be broken down into a number of sub-principles, if you like. And so these are the things by which you can measure how well you are meeting that particular principle. And so I won't read them out again. Um, I'm, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with them, but, um, but these are certainly available from the GoFair site if you want to look at them. And, and some of you may may even be authors of this for all I know, but uh, but the ARDC have made a, a tool, a fair, fair self-assessment tool, they call it. And it, it effectively, it's a, it, this is a slightly old iteration of it now. It looks like it's changed since I last, since I looked at it last year. But anyway, it's, it, it's essentially the, the questions I showed on the previous slide here, all these F1 to F4, et cetera, et cetera, are all expressed in these, these questions here. And then there's a bunch of answers and the answers have um, a certain level of influence on where this green bar will slide across the, the, the line. So essentially this green bar for findable is solid. So that's indicating like a 100% 100, 100 uh, score for this particular set of four questions and, and accessible slightly less, interoperable, etc. And then you can add, a, they've got a total down here. 
So the, the purpose of this tool, and 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 um, you know, we've been uh, we've probably ride, ridden a little rough shot over its original intention. And the intention of this thing was educational and informational, according to the website. So basically, it wasn't designed to be used in a quantitative, comparative way at this stage. However, as soon as you put something out on the internet and you, you, you've given it scores, then it's, it's almost open slather and that's exactly what we've done. We've buried into the HTML code and we, we've extracted the um, essentially the guts of how this works. And the reason why we've done it, used this one, is because it's, uh, first of all, it's available. It's one of the, the most clear and um, effective ones that we saw. But it's also because people who know more about fair compliance have actually thought about how they weight scores and things. You know, somebody else has done that work, something people who actually know what they're talking about. So we're more than happy to borrow that expertise. And so that's kind of what we've done. So if you look under the hood of that, you can, you can see the answers to all of those questions here. And you can get, you can see the scoring, this, this 8310. And of course, it's not a, a linear scoring. Um, there are the the best answers or the most complete uh, ways of answering tend to be uh, give you a higher scores, obviously. But sometimes it's it's not a linear fashion. And so these are the scores that are applied through the under the hood in that particular application. So what we've done, or Maria, I should say, is, is, is put that into something which we could utilize in a, a more efficient way for our purposes. So basically, we built a, a spreadsheet version of that. So the idea there is, is for every question, you can nominate one of these questions, and that gives you, it tells you which score you're going to get for that. And then it basically adds them all up, and then you, you get a, like a percentage of, of compliance for each one of these questions. So that's what we did. So for all of those um, 50 data sets that we, I showed you earlier, we have basically run the spreadsheet over and we, we've attempted to um, score each based on all of these questions. Does it have a license? You know, is, is it, has it got a piece of metadata? Has it got a, a, a DOI attached to it? That sort of, so all of those questions were asked of each of these. It was done in a very manual way. So, so Maria, would would go to the data set um, manager so this is the person who understands most about that data set and she would go through them with this bunch of questions she could at some level anticipate their answers or, or give them guidance about what they should be answering because not everyone is au fait with all of these sort of terminologies and stuff so it was very much it was quite a manual time intensive project process but ultimately it was actually very good for the data set manager to be involved in this process because they got a sense of what is really important from a fair concept point of view for their particular data set so it was actually very a good educational exercise so here is the results for the nationally significant collections and databases so you can see five columns on the right here you've got all the all the data sets listed on the left and so the fair are the accessible interoperable reasonable and then a sort of a, a a combination of those expressed as a percentage here as a total sense of fair compliance for each one of those so there's a whole raft of numbers there it's not particularly digestible in this form so what i'll do is i'll show you something which is maybe a little bit simpler to to follow so this is both sets of data sets. There's not all of them, but there's just a selection of both. So we've got the nationally significant ones up here. And then on the, on the lower part, we've got the, the high value natural hazard data sets. So green is where the, the each data set achieved the best possible score for that particular question. And so you can get a sense of where it's green, it's, it's good. It's, it's really fair compliant by those standards. And where it gets a, a pink score is the lowest possible score. So you can see that some data sets within the nationally significant ones are scoring green quite consistently, whereas some are showing a few pinks, which means that they're not nearly so compliant. 
look at the natural hazard ones down below, there's a there's a lot more pink showing. So basically, this is saying that the the natural high value natural hazard data sets are not as fair compliant as as the other ones. Another way of looking at it. <clears throat> You can see the individual question components colored in here, but essentially the findable are these two groups here. The one on the left is the nationally significant uh, databases, and this is the natural hazard ones. And so you can see that the natural hazard ones are always lower in terms of their, um, their compliance score. I'm just going to divert a little bit into the importance of metadata because this has been absolutely critical to um, getting a sense of fair compliance. And, and it does it in two ways. The, the presence of metadata, of course, is, is in, in a uh, in some and something that's harvested and, and so on, is that it, it's findable. You know, if you've got metadata, that makes it findable. So that's a, a great start. But metadata is also the way that you can express its, um, how accessible it is, uh, its interoperability, so you can reference how it is interoperable, whether the data are referencing um, vocabularies, for example, or following data models, and the reusable component. So the, the in, embedded in the metadata are statements around the licensing and and um, and the provenance lineage of the data. So so the top. Um, so metadata is absolutely critical to the data quality story. So, you know, I look at some of our sister organizations in, in New Zealand around in the science space, and some of them don't have well-developed data set catalogs. And so I think they're going to be struggling from, from a point of, view, point of view until they do have something like this in place. Um, and you can see some of those elements. So I won't go into the details of these. Um, Harvested. Anyway, so so getting back to the results, so we're saying that the the NS the nationally significant databases are consistently scoring better than the natural hazard ones. Um, the findability is is high in both data sets because we do have that metadata catalog. Accessibility is um, a little bit variable. Um, some, some some of the natural hazard data sets are not needing to be made public or open, um, whereas the nationally significant ones, that's, a, that's a, a requirement. So good accessibility is really important there. The interoperability is lowest in, in both categories, and I think that reflects the lack of standards which are appropriate to some of those particular types of data sets. I mean, I work in the geological mapping space and we've actually got some really good international standards that uh, we are applying. So that's the GSIML uh, data model and it's this uh, the international vocabularies that we bring to the score, but not every data set has that sort of resource available to them. So hence the interoperability scores are generally on the lower side. Our lower reusable scores are in part due to not so great um, um, practices within our own organization around defining licenses. So we, we, we've been a little bit ad hoc in that space, and I think that's reflected in some of our reusability scores. And to be fair, some of the metadata content around the describing the provenance of the data, the lineage, is is not as as fulsome as it probably should be. So I think, you know, and that's an area that we can make some some Im improvement in. And of course, I think it's it's pretty obvious that the national significant databases, because of their sort of um, consistent and uh, funding and, and pretty good funding it, it makes a big difference in being able to support uh, fair or data quality in general and so these these scores you know we, we ran this um, process a couple of years ago um, it certainly marked areas that we could improve and we've actually gone a long way to doing some of that improvement for example, even through the process of doing the assessment, we realize, well, hey, if we create DOIs for all of these data sets, then, then our scores go up instantly. So, you know, that was almost something we did as we were running the survey. Um, whereas improvements in terms of licensing and, 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 um, and um, 
wordage around lineage provenance and so forth is something that uh, is sort of ongoing but but through that process and if we were to run this using the same parameters uh, as as we did two years ago then we would expect to see a a, a climb in, in scores across the board and so this is sort of feeding into our wider um, data management maturity model work that we're doing so fee is an important component of that and it's also giving us a sense of okay how good is our data and where do we need to get our data into the future so in a, so I guess and 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 I've just been expressing some of this but if, if you want to be pragmatic about well, what are the things that make a difference in terms of improving uh, fair compliance well these are the things that refer to uh, within each of those so I mentioned DOIs under the findable category that makes a, a big difference in terms of the score if you don't already have those um if, if your metadata are har harvestable you know that again that, that works really well um some of the stuff is, is it doesn't really change very much if you if it's on a the server then it's probably uh, has to be um under these conditions anyway but the apis are important um and so on the interoperability if there are um, standards out there around data models or, or terminology and so forth and you adopt those then those are going to have, have an influence on your compliance levels and then reusable as I said before it's about making sure the license is, can, um, is, is, is clearly expressed you know if by default you just put in creative commons by attribution then you've gone a long way forward to to uh, to ensuring that uh yeah, and then just increasing the 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 um, how clear and, and and you are around how the data have been put together, the provenance it makes a big difference too. So GNS is is one of what we call the Crown Research Institutes, and there are another five five um, Crown Research Institutes and a relatively recent initiative is to try and get some of our data into a common platform or at least findable through a common platform and this is the platform here we're calling ourselves the national environmental data center it's uh not unlike well i should say it's 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 a it's a step in the direction to what you guys the australians have already got in terms of your um research data australia um platform where you have the ability to search for uh, the spectrum of science data uh, in, in the Australian uh, science scape so this is this is our early steps towards that and, and effectively we've got a, a bit of a, an online um, catalog for doing that um, and the reason I'm mentioning that is that we're of as a as a collective group of crown research institutes we're also going through a data quality exercise and this is a some work that we've been doing on that and effectively it's it's built upon fair so virtually all of these um terms in this checklist here relate to things which are addressing fair principles in one way or another so you know does it have a lot of terms of use is it i've got a license for example common format you know that addresses interoperable to some extent reusable is referring to the data lineage and so on and so on so what we've been doing is each uh, CRI has put up all of its important databases that can be accessed into the portal and now we're running the ruler over them say well do they actually are they do they have data quality that is acceptable for them to be there or do we actually have to improve the quality or take them down so this is what I've done through a, a spreadsheet here so this is the on the on the left hand side of some of these data sets that we have now on this this um shared portal and again the, the color is much the same green is something where the checklist thing is present so it has a license or it's got it addresses a, a model or it uh, um, it's got a provenance statement etc etc red uh, pink is where it's not there 
and orange is where it may be there or it, it, but it's not um, it's partially present or it's maybe a bit difficult to find so but anyway just giving this spreadsheet here is just giving us a, a quick visual about what is the status of of the data sets we're pushing up and you know you could argue that maybe the Cenozoic mollusca of New Zealand one is has got too many orange or pink scores and, and needs some work to make it acceptable to lodge on the site or if we can't do that then we simply take it down so this is yeah so this is a sort of a, a parallel and related um it's not quite as prescriptive as the, the the scored version affair that we're doing this is much more of a um um, um a qualitative assessment so this is my last slide I think <laughs> I think it is um anyway so so I guess having gone through the exercise and on the high value ones that we looked at I think by and large we are measurably fair so we can actually tick the box to say we are pretty compliant and 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 but what's more is we can say almost how exactly how compliant we are and so I think that's been a a, a good step forward as mentioned before that our data managers have actually learnt a lot through this process so I think in terms of data management um, being ex exposed to ways of understanding data quality is actually really important for them so it's it's not just about you know the the accuracy of the numbers or anything like that it's actually about the quality of the data the, the, the things that are important to the end users in terms of being able to use that data down the track and then in the last statement is really just that your money does make a difference in terms of that compliance so there's a couple of links there if you uh, this this um this report is um um uh, is publicly available it's a it's a gns internal well it's not internal but it is externally available so that is available for for download uh, you probably don't have this presentation but uh, and and there's the link to the cross cri one so with that, I'm going to stop 